So our next lecture will be given by Estelle Duflo. Uh, she was born in Paris in the early 1970s, the daughter of a math professor and a pediatrician. Uh, so after high school, Esther went on to the École Normale Supérieure uh, with the intention to specialize in history. So during a year in Moscow, she was supposed to work on her undergraduate essay, but she also worked as a research assistant to some famous economists who were there to uh, advise the Russian, new Russian government. And uh, having seen the power of economics uh, to change policy, Esther returned to Paris, uh, finished her ENS degree, turned to a master's in economics, and then went on to MIT for graduate school. Turned out MIT hired her as an assistant professor in 1999, directly after his, her PhD, and she has never joined another university after that. But Esther's whole career has been devoted to practical research on how best to alleviate poverty in its different shades and form. And in many ways, she has indeed followed that path that she saw in Moscow and become very successful in influencing policy, not the least by linking up many researchers to policymakers. So appropriately, today's lecture is entitled Field Experiments and the Practice of Policy. Please. Good afternoon. Um, the three of us have been repeating this is a prize for a movement. Um, so at the risk of embarrassing uh, people, I'm going to try and make that uh, physically clear today. So I'm going to ask uh, the people I'm calling by organization, not by name, to stand up so people in the room can see what a movement is. So let's start maybe by the, anybody who has ever worked for JPAL or IPA. Uh, anybody who has ever worked for a, a PAD? Stay up, <laughs> the JPAL IPA people don't get to sit down. Uh, um, Jeff, you also represent USAID. Uh, Rachel, you also represent DFID. Uh, the Jamil family, the Vice family. Uh, any uh, affiliates of uh, JPAL? Uh, anybody who has ever run an RCT and who happens not to be an affiliate of JPAL? Uh, and any graduate student who uh, is uh, doing development or thinking they might do development? Uh, so I'm going to start by clapping for these people. If I forget anybody, yell. <laughs> but. We believe this is a price for a movement. A movement involves researchers, it involves staff, it, invol it involves money, it involves a partner. I forgot Pratham. <laughs> Pratham, where is Pratham? Ah, they're not here. So think about Pratham. Any, par any NGO partner, government partner, we can clap them anyways. <laughs> and Amrita, anybody who, uh, it involves money, it involves partners, it involves uh, um, thousands of boots on the grounds, uh, some of which whom are reached today. Um, so thank you very much for that. One of the really magnificent thing about uh, this prize is that I genuinely think people are, uh, are truthful when everybody thinks it's a little bit for all of them. Even our old critics came back out of the woodwork to criticize again just to get a piece of the action, which has been kind of interesting. Uh, so I was not really uh, meant to uh, to become an economist. Um, as uh, uh, the daughter of a mathematician, I thought I would be uh, an academic. Uh, my hero were Gauss or uh, Leroy Ladurie. Uh, as the uh, daughter of a, a physician, I, I kind of, uh, and one who was spending time in developing countries, I, I uh, wanted to uh, be a change maker. Uh, that's a photo of me trying to accelerate my career as a change maker. That's in 1991 in, uh, in Russia, not the year I lived there, two years before, I'm 18. 
and I'm trying to kind of uh, crash into a revolution that is not really mine. Um, I actually did a little bit of economics at, as an undergrad, but I really had no trust in economists. Uh, like most people, actually. So this is a graph from much more recent, from 2017. It turns out that economists are some of the least trusted about their own field of expertise, just above politicians. Uh, and it doesn't ask, you know, how much whether economists are trusted for dating advice or well, the trust in weather forecasters is about twice as big as the trust for uh, for economists. And I was very much there when I started economics as an undergraduate. I really, th uh, again, I wanted to be a change maker. I thought economics was just an elaborate hoax to uh, justify uh, the world exactly as it was uh, by putting some uh, not particularly interesting mathematics on it. And yet, uh, 28 years later, I guess I'm here. I'm an economist. Um, and to some extent, uh, among with among all of the other people that we talked about, I, uh, I have become uh, something of a change maker. So this map represents uh, the places not where we are uh, conducting projects, but where uh, uh, JPAL has affected policy uh, in any uh, number of ways. Uh, so these are pretty much, there is one of these dots almost in all continents. Uh, there are various ways in which JPAL has influenced policies. The way we count it, uh, when we first started, uh, when we have first, before we became JPAL, we were PAL, Poverty Action Lab. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, Rachel, uh, as the first executive director of Poverty Action Lab, has to be credited for that uh, magnificent name. Uh, and shortly after, we met uh, Mohamed Jamil, and it, he, he was kind of challenging us to think, how many people you think you can affect? And we were like, what's the big number? And we saw okay, 100,000, 100 million, that seems like a big number. We thought it was a bit of a crazy number. But yet, as of now, the way we count uh, our influence in the world in the sense of the influence of the whole JPL network, these 400 researchers who are associated with it, is that for over 400 million people have been affected by policies which have been found to be effective by uh, uh, someone in the JPL network. That's without counting all the, of the people who have not been affected by policies which have found to be ineffective uh, by the JPL network, which is probably also an important number, but a little bit harder to track. So what I want to talk about today is how that uh, change happens. Uh, so let me start a little bit like Abhijit by uh, the straw man. Uh, so the straw man is that um, you run a, a small, uh, well-designed experiment, uh, well, very controlled with very uh, uh, excellent partners, you know, uh, maybe 100 schools, 50 treatment, 50 control, uh, really tightly monitor what is going on on the ground, uh, get some effects, uh, so that's your results. Then you prepare a, a, a shiny uh, policy brief, and then you pedal it to uh, policymakers, and then they adopt and uh, there is full-scale adoption. So that's kind of the straw man. Maybe to some extent it's a bit more than a straw man in the sense it might have been the model that at some point at least I personally thought would be kind of the model we would follow, but it turns out that it's not the model. So let me first start by saying what are various criticisms that people have, have expressed to this model. Well, if you run small experiments, you know, they are gold-plated, so when uh, you go at larger scale, you won't have the same effect. Um, also, the sum, the, if you run an experiment somewhere, the result will be valid for this one place, but how do you know that they will be valid elsewhere? Uh, and in any case, all experiments have some issues, so are you sure that you really have a perfect uh, solution? Um, and then when you prepare your, your policy brief, you know, even if we could believe your results, the policymakers are they going to be interested? It really depends on what they are doing, and nobody is going to pay much attention anyways. And if they did, when they are actually going to implement the project for all of the reasons above, plus the fact that when something is scaled up, um, uh, um, stuff happens, <laughs> the effects are not going to be what you expect. There is going to be... Uh, uh, effects that are going to be different in equilibrium, there is going to be some political economy reaction, and so on and so forth. 
So really, the idea that you can go from a small experiment to widespread adoption is a myth. And well, maybe, but it turns out that it is really not the way that it works. You don't just do your small experiment, write your policy brief, and go away. It is uh, not at all the way that the policy influence, the policy dialogue, I would say, has taken place. Let me give you some example of various ways in which this is quite different. So the first one I want to start with is microcredit, because in a way, microcredit would be the closest model where of this in the sense that the, the impacts that were found have had an influence on their own without even direct uh, follow through with, uh, uh, with governments or with organizations. But even there, as I'll describe in a minute, the process is much more uh, elaborate than uh, just uh, doing an experiment, getting the results, diffusing them. So in the 2000s, as you might well remember in uh, Scandinavian countries, uh, microcredit was all the rage. It was all the rage in the media. Of course, Mohamed Yunus uh, received the Nobel Prize in 2006. And the idea that it was, it, has the, it, it had such a large scale, today it reached about 200 million people, that it had the possibility to uh, change the world if it was effective. It was really, it would have massive effect. Uh, and there was a lot of anecdotes that it could help. You had a lot of success stories, etc., but very little uh, hard evidence on whether it had any effect on poverty. And then um, the tone shifted somewhere actually shortly after the Nobel Prize, which I hope is not a harbinger, harbinger of things to come for us. Uh, and you started hearing like bad stories, you know, from again mostly from the media, mostly mostly anecdotes of people trapped in micro debt, of farmer suicide, of people who were kind of under uh, too much debt from microcredit, etc. And uh, we still had no really on either side no evidence to say either ways. And all this time, several of us had been quite desperate, Din here and Abhijit and I and others had been desperate to find a partner to do an evaluation of microcredit. But while the going were good, there was not too much enthusiasm uh, for, for an impact evaluation for microcredit. And finally, we started to get some traction. And the first two projects were in the Philippines uh, and in India. In the Philippines, the, the, project, the, the effects were kind of OK. In the India, they were kind of not great. But when we got the India results, we were actually very wary of getting them, of diffusing them. Because the, the, the first evaluation we had done, uh, uh, Rachel and uh, Abhijit and me were involved, and Annie was actually running around the, uh, uh, trying to get it off the ground. This was in Hyderabad, which is the hotbed of microcredit in India, saturated with other form of access to credit. So we felt, well, maybe that's why it's, it could be that it's why it's not that effective, because there is so many other alternatives that people have. So we kind of sat and waited and didn't do much with this result, certainly in terms of diffusing them, because we didn't think we had enough to go on to, for anybody to draw conclusion. And then progressively st studies started to accumulate and finally we could put them all together and publish them uh, together with the same format and the same template which allowed uh, uh, the to analyze them together, which is some work that Rachel Miger, who was at the time a PhD student at MIT did, which is to say, let's look at all the countries where we did microcredit evaluation. We can look at the results individually, those are the, the blue chart, or we can try to combine them together with some statistical modeling and say what they tell us together, and in particular, do they want to tell us all the same story or are they going all over the place? And what you can see from the red dot is the, the red bars is that they want to all tell us the same story, which is ah, not much happening in terms of profit anyways. And if we look at average effects on various things, really not much happening either way for the average person, which on the one hand means no one is really hot, but on the other hand means the average person doesn't get out of poverty because of microcredit. 
Another thing we found, though, by, by, uh, from this series of studies, that if you look at people who already had a business before microcredit started, then those people actually benefit from microcredit. And in fact, we've continued to follow them over time, and we see that they start benefiting a lot 10 years later. So it's not that there is no effect on anybody, but the effects are heterogeneous, and the average effects are uh, quite uh, mediocre. So that led to a sort of a changing in the debate. Uh, from this is a disaster versus this is a miracle to, and that's quite remarkable for the media, a relative kind of neutral tone. Uh, small is smart, a partial marvel is probably the best uh, title, but then it's the economists, they are good at titles, uh, or small chance. So that changed the policy debate, actually changed also the view of many microfinance organizations, and of course, eventually changed microfinance, because we were not against microfinance. In fact, we, a lot of us really want microfinance to succeed. What this result suggested is that the product that were evaluated, which is this one-side-fits-all fits type of product, really doesn't, is not ideal, probably. Because uh, on the one hand, uh, the, the, there is heterogeneity. Some people need something else. Some people really need consumption finance. Some people need business lending with more flexible loan, etc. So the second wave of experiments on microfinance was very much about experimenting on the terms of microfinance, finding out, for example, whether people would do better if they had a grace period of a month before starting to repay, uh, seeing whether the group structure, which is very rigid, was really that necessary, trying to find ways to identify the most entrepreneurial of the possible clients and lend to them, and so on and so forth. So that this set of, of work doesn't lead to saying to a one yes, no microfinance, thumbs up, thumbs down, but how do you make microfinance into an effective product for the relevant segment of the population? Let me give you a second example, which is uh, an example where it was more than producing the results uh, and then uh, a new wave of working together, but it was going from this time a positive results all the way to policy impact at scale and try to give you a little bit of a sense of how that takes place and how that's far of cry from uh, just getting the results and moving out. And that's the example of teaching at the right level. So in many developing countries, a key uh, feature is that many kids are in school, uh, but most of them are not learning very much. So this is a picture for for India, where you can see that a little uh, under half of the kids can read at standard two level when they reach standard five. Uh, the, the performance is even worse in mathematics, where it's closer to 25%. So, of course, it's a huge waste. And a bunch of experiments have taken place which can help us see whether it's because they don't have inputs. In fact, Michael's very first project was on textbooks. So is it a lack of inputs? Is it because teachers are underpaid? Is it because they are not willing? Is it because parents are um, um, lazy and so on and so forth? And cutting a long story short, it's really none of that. What it really seems to be in a large part is that the pedagogy is inappropriate to most of the kids. In fact, most of the developing countries, with who, which are former colonies, still have this very uh, elitist uh, um, curriculum, which are coming to some extent from the fact that originally the systems were set up uh, to educate a small elite that was going to be uh, uh, helping the, the, the colonial power. And then at independence, the system were just expanded as is because it's politically very difficult to somehow scale down because it's a little bit like if you were shortchanging the children. But the result is that kids are taught not at all at the level where they can learn, but at some aspirational level, uh, which is uh, way far what most of them can comprehend. So then the solution seems deceptively simple is to teach them at the right level. Now, one could think the ideal thing would be to do it through the curriculum, but as I said, this is not really a popular move. So we started working, uh, in fact, it was my first RCT, started working with Pratham, uh, and this year, uh, Rukmini Banerjee and Madhav Chavan, the first people uh, from Pratham we work with, the first and the second leader of the organization. Um, and the idea of Pratham is very simple. You have to teach to the kids you have in front of you. So what they have is to rearrange, the, 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 the way the, pro the programs works today is to rearrange the kids by level, uh, 
all the time by achievement level in a frequent way and then target the activities to where the kids are. Um, and we started evaluating this project. The first version of the program project was a remedial education uh, a program that we evaluated with uh, Sean some time back. Um, and um, then we, we looked at it in, uh, uh, in, in more rural areas. And then uh, we started getting interested in whether teachers could implement this, this approach. And this was done in summer camps. Uh, and they could do it. And all, in all of those cases, the, the results were positive. One shortcut, one shortcoming uh, of doing the, 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 the project on a volunteer basis is that you don't have all the children that you would like to have because they don't necessarily come. So it seems like a waste that they are in school all this time and not being taught at the right level. And it seems that it would be more efficient if the teachers could teach at the right level. So Pratam got very interested in scaling it up via the education system, which of course makes a lot of sense. And they started to get some traction in doing this work. And when they got some traction doing this work, we could evaluate their work by carving down of some villages to do, if you want, the reverse of a randomized control trial, where what we have is we carve out a control group out of in an environment where most of the schools have the program being tested. So we can test this kind of scaled up version by carving out a control group uh, from an otherwise sea of treated areas. And what we found there when we did it the first time is that although the teachers had been quite excited to be trained, when they came back to the schools, they didn't implement the program. And as we had this program going on, we had a uh, qualitative work uh, and, uh, done by an uh, Indian organization and uh, interviewing people up and down the hierarchy. And what came out of it is that the teachers think it's nice, but they don't have time to do these activities because they have to complete the curriculum. Which, by the way, they have to do by law. So you cannot blame them to want to complete the curriculum because it happens to be their job. And of course, this also happens to be their job because it had been scaled up within the government, but it had not been really conveyed. So in the presence of these different uh, tensions between, in the, between their activities, they decided to stay safe and continue teaching the curriculum. So then if the answer was, and that's something where we had the complete, you know, we kept uh, talking to Pratam, discussing with them, uh, they are ahead of the game most of the time on us, but this having the study helped in figuring out that there was a problem to solve. The answer was like, you either need to carve out a time in the year, so doing it in short bursts of camps, or, or you have to carve out a time in the day, say an hour per day, and you have to make it very clear that it is their job by involving the hierarchy, by involving their bosses. So the new versions of the program either worked in short bursts of activities or in with teacher or with uh, uh, during the regular school days, but in a dedicated time with, t with training of the teacher supervisors who were then able to kind of relay the program, both help, but also remind them that yes, yes, this is in fact part of your job and you are not to convert the hour into uh, uh, something else because you want to complete your curriculum. In the meantime, uh, there had been some uh, tests of the same program in Ghana. Uh, and he was leading uh, 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 a team of Ghanaian to India, lost some of them along the way. So that's part of the danger of doing policy making when you lose your uh, 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 higher official of uh, the Ghana education team in the middle of India, but they got found. And uh, uh, thanks to that, the whole thing didn't get stuck. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and then this, these two models that I talked about, the camps and the teacher-led model, happened, and both of these showed positive effects. And if you know, this is a long way in coming in having a program that actually has uh, can a lot of staying power, can actually be scaled up. And now this program is being scaled up. Uh, so these are some of the co-conspirators in this work. Now this program actually is being scaled up not only in India in a large way where it reached the, you know, several million children, but with support from co-impact in, uh, in, in many countries in Africa right now. So this is to give you a sense of how the project of going from a nice proof of, proof of concept to an actual scalable program goes on. 
what should have been clear here is that the, pro the process of going, of, of working together to develop a project that can be uh, implemented at scale is not something that uh, academics do uh, sort of in isolation of the organization or as the, uh, you know, giving advice and uh, being uh, somewhat superior to the organization or whatever. It's really a project of uh, co-creation. And that project of co-creation is now very much going on as well, directly with governments, where a lot of the work that many affiliates of JPL and IPA and others who run RCT do is now to help to work directly with governments to help them do what they would like to do anyways. So in some cases, I've called this uh, addressing the plumbing problems in the sense that it's not about, oh, should I invest in health or in education? But it's about, well, I have this, say, uh, rice distribution program that is currently going on, and there are issues with it. What can we try to make it work better? And so the example uh, of, of that is a, uh, that I'm going to give today is a uh, work by many people whose photos you're going to see uh, in a minute. And it um, uh, concerns the uh, in rice distribution pro uh, project in Indonesia. The rice distribution program is a massive redistribution uh, uh, program, which is uh, funded uh, centrally but administered locally. And uh, has an extremely large budget uh, and has, as many, many programs, a lot of issues. In particular, it has the problems that uh, the poor receive only 30% of the subsidy that is intended um, and pay, in general, more than what they, sh they should be paying for, about 25% more. And the reason the government felt was, in part, that they are not uh, properly informed that the program is going. So Ben Olken and Rima Anna, who, has been who have been working in Indo Indonesia for many years, have a very long running, uh, standing relationship with the government. And there is often a, um, a back and forth between possible project and possible policy ideas where the government com comes up with them for questions. And here the question was, what about if we distributed a card uh, that made people aware that uh, they are eligible for this program? And they said, well, why not? So this is now the full team, Abhijit, Rima, Jordan, Kyle, Ben Olken, and Sud uh, Sudarno. What did they do? What did they say? They said, well, great, we can set up an experiment. In fact, we can do it on quite a large scale because this program is everywhere and distributing cards is not particularly expensive. But as long as we are going to set up an experiment, why don't we try not only whether distributing cards would be effective, but also what would be the ideal ways to distribute the cards. So why don't we vary, for example, the information that's on the card? Would it be important for people to know uh, what the price at which they are eligible for the card, or would it not really uh, matter? So you can see the difference in the cards. Would it matter uh, if everybody who is eligible gets the card, or just a few in the village, so people know the program exists? Would it matter if we plastered the village with posters such that not only the eligible people know that they are eligible, but the officials know that they know, and the people know that the officials know that they know, and so on and so forth, such that it changes the way in which people bargain? Uh, would it be important if the cards also had some clip and coupons that the official could, would, would be supposed to give up upstairs to create also the impression there is that there is accountability in the program. So not only they tried the cards, but they tried all these versions of the cards. And when they did that, they found not only uh, the best, uh, the effect of the cards, but also the best version of the card. The best version of the card is to have the common knowledge and to put the price in and to give it to as many people as possible. And the accountability is not that important. And that version of the cards, uh, are increased uh, the tick-up of the program a lot. Overall, distributing cards increased uh, the tick-up of the, of the program, increased the subsidies that people get, which is a combination of the tick-up and the price paid by 26%, driven by a reduction in, in leakage. So obviously, it's very cost-effective because it's not very expensive to distribute cards. And therefore, it's something that the government scaled up almost immediately after they were finished with the program. 
So here you can see an immediate scale up following the research project, but, by, but that's because the research project is part of the government functioning itself. And there are several examples like that. I just wanted to give you one more because it's one which involves, again, uh, a quite uh, focused pr process of really thinking through an economic problem together uh, with the government partner, combining a good knowledge or a decent knowledge, let's say, of economics with uh, excellent knowledge, I would say, of the institution on the ground. And that's the uh, reforming the, the, uh, the auditing of farms in Gujarat. That also is, I think, an important project in terms of its themes because it's about pollution and it's and reducing pollution and, pollution and curbing climate change is one of the big challenges we'll have to solve in the years to come. So Gujarat is actually uh, has been kind of on the forefront of trying to do something about uh, about their, their pollution problem. It's actually one of the most polluted uh, places in India. Uh, the fast one of the fastest industrial production uh, state in terms of industrial production and therefore in terms of industrial pollution. Uh, a few years ago, the court forced them to create a third party audit system, which is uh, one system where each firm has to hire an independent auditor to give them an audit every year, a clean bill of health in terms of environment. So that sounds great in many ways because uh, you have um, uh, 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 people with competence that come in that might not exist within the government, but it's not great in a pretty key way, which is it creates uh, a conflict of interest between the auditor and the firm, because the firm pays the auditor. See, the auditor has all of the incentive to give the firm exactly what they want, which is a clean bill of health regardless. Uh, so we... Um, to find that if it was really an issue. So we were discussing with the government, they really had a sense that this was a problem and that the audit system was almost defunct. And that's actually why we got in touch with them. But to you know, test it, we uh, compared the results from the audit form. So these are the audit report. And you can see that most of the forms are right below the threshold in terms of this particular uh, pollutant, SPM. So either that means that the firms are really competent at uh, targeting their pollution level, or that means that the auditors are making up the data to be exactly in the right place. And of course, the, the latter is correct in this case, because once you back check those firms, you find that the true pollution of the firm is all over the place uh, compared to the audit. So the, the back check are performed uh, a few days after, and you can see how the pollution actually distributes with many firms polluting much more, some firms polluting even much less. That means not only they are making up the data, but they're not even taking the trouble of going to the farm. They, but that said, if you're going to make up the data, why uh, spend the cost of actually collecting it? So what we proposed, uh, um, that's uh, uh, Michael Greenstone, Roy Nipande, Nikrain, and myself, what we proposed is to say, look, this, the problem is really the conflict of interest. There is a the loyalty of the auditing firm is to the polluting firm, it's not to society. So you have to break that down. So instead of having the firm hire the auditing firm, create a pool which is going to be used to pay the auditors, number one, uh, then randomly assign the auditors to the, to, the polluting, to the firm to be monitored every day, and then um, uh, pay them based on their accuracy. So once we did that, uh, we had a, a much more accurate uh, uh, treatment. This is now the treatment and the back check, and you can see that the audit and the treatment look very much like the back check. So basically, almost all of the lying of the auditors got removed by simply having this in place. So that's an example where we were kind of working with them, bringing our economics, bringing our knowledge of the institution to do something together. Here again, they adopted it for all of Gujarat. So the court, Supreme Court approved it as a way of implementing the scheme, and this is now what is done in Gujarat. More generally, these two, these examples and many others like that are an example of what we are trying to do, which is try to, in a sense, you know, slowly, but little by little, making ourselves irrelevant uh, by uh, create, creating, fostering a culture of learning, both within the government and be within all of the institutions that support them. So many governments have launched uh, units that do a randomized control trial on their own, like the Minelu Lab in Peru. We have long-standing partnership uh, with government, for example, the Tamil Nadu a research partnership. And the hope is that one day, 
in a sense, we can make ourselves irrelevant. And that would be kind of the culmination of the, uh, of the process if the culture of learning had developed uh, so much that uh, it would take place by many actors in many, many different ways. Thank you very much.